Hello science fans! Welcome to Sciencia. Our topic for today is building your introduction. The introduction is your first chance to make a good first impression on your audience. So, you have to make it clear, complete, and concise. A good introduction has two general parts. The first part contains information about the research opportunity that you want to be involved with, while the second portion gives your readers an overview of what you want to do with your research. The first half generally contains the background of the study, the research problem or opportunity that you want to tackle, and also the research questions that you want answered. The second half, on the other hand, contains the research objectives of your study, your scope and limitations, as well as the significance of the study. The first half of your introduction is highly dependent on the creation of a robust review of related literature. That's why even if the introduction is the first chapter of a research proposal or a research paper, it is still better for you to do your RRL first. So here, we see that you start with the general research problem or research domain that you want to tackle and then move down to a more specific research problem. From there, you talk about your RRL or at least what others have done in a summarized manner and then highlight the gaps or limitations of the previous research that has been done. And then finally, you end the first half by telling us, your readers, what you want to do. To give you a concrete example of how an introduction is written, I present to you a paper that my students and I wrote for their own thesis. It was about the effects of acid rain on the growth of the mung bean plant, Vigna radiata. So the general topic that my students wished to tackle during their thesis was on air pollution, specifically acid rain. So what they wanted to check was how acid rain affected the growth and development of an economically important plant. And in this case, we decided to focus on mung beans. Now, the RRL, or the Review of Related Literature that we did, looked at reports of acid rain in the Philippines, the different contents of acid rain and its effect on the soil, and how it has affected other plants or even the same plants within the genus or species. Finally, we highlighted the gaps or limitations in the previous studies, such as, for example, the only parameters that were measured in mung beans before were weight, as well as successful fruiting. But there were no records yet of shoot length, root length, and of course, when the acid rain starts to have an effect in the whole life cycle of the plant. So we end our introduction by stating the problem that we want to tackle, which is the identification of the effects of acid rain on the mung bean at its different stages in the life cycle of the organism. Once you've stated your research problem, it's best to identify your hypothesis as well. As I mentioned in my previous videos, creation of a hypothesis can be very tricky. So one thing that I would like to emphasize in this video is the difference between a hypothesis and a prediction. A hypothesis is a proposed explanation of a phenomenon based on previous research. So again, this is where the RRL is very, very important and it is falsifiable through the research that you're going to do. A prediction, on the other hand, is an estimation or an approximation of what will happen to an organism or to an event given a certain set of parameters. I will now show you the difference between a hypothesis and a prediction. As you can see from the statements on the screen, a hypothesis gives us an explanation of why a certain event will occur, whereas a prediction tells us what we expect will happen. A scientific proposal and a scientific paper should have a hypothesis and not a prediction. However, at this point, I would like to highlight that the hypothesis I'm talking about here is different from a statistical hypothesis. 
a statistical hypothesis very rarely appears in the introductions of papers, and it is often noted by scientists prior to them doing a statistical test. So it is not something that you see in an introduction, but it is still something critical for you to do, especially in the methodology. A statistical hypothesis is linked to the process of the scientific method. But before we talk about what the statistical hypothesis is, let me just remind you that science is a process of disproving all possible explanations to a phenomenon until you're left with one. So it's not about trying to prove something, it's trying to eliminate all possible explanations until you have the most probable one. So when it comes to your statistical hypothesis, they usually come in pairs. You have your null hypothesis, which is the hypothesis that we will be testing based on the experiments that you're going to perform, and you have the alternative hypothesis, which will be accepted only when the null hypothesis is rejected. So the easiest way to remember this is that the null and alternative hypothesis are usually opposites of each other. So on the screen, what you're seeing right now would be the counterpart null and alternative hypothesis of the Mung Beam study that we're proposing. Please take note that this is completely different from the hypothesis that needs to be in the introduction. So now that you have introduced the problem that you want to tackle to your readers, you can now move on to the second half of your introduction, which outlines what you want to do in your research. The, the first part that comes here would be an enumeration of your research objectives. In a nutshell, your research objectives tells us the goal of your research, and this should serve to you as a reminder of what you want to do as you continue on with the experiment. After all, any conquest without a goal is meaningless. The objectives of a research paper can be divided into two sets, the general objective and the specific objectives. The general objective presents an overview of your entire goal, while the specific objectives break it down into accomplishable parts. So presented to you here is an example of a research objective for the paper that I was talking about. As you can see, it's very straightforward. The words are not too long. And always remember, when you're writing your own, you have to keep it simple. When you start writing your specific objectives, this makes what you want to do more real for you and for your reader. So as much as possible, your specific objective should be realistic and attainable. Now, while you're writing this, please remember also that most research are time-bound. So you have to know how long you have to perform your research when you're trying to outline this. So, for our study on the Mung Beam Plan, you can see from the specific research objectives that my students and I made that we actually defined the length of the study which is approximately 120 days, plus or minus the additional days needed to perform the chemical tests that we're going to do. The specific chemical parameters that we wanted to measure, which is basically the water content, organic content, and inorganic content of the plant. And also that we want to identify at which stage in the life cycle of the mung bean plant that the acid rain will start to affect. So this makes our objectives very clear, and at the same time, we are also avoiding over-promising to our audience. So this is something you might want to avoid because at the end of the day, when you complete your research, your objectives are going to be used to weigh your paper if you are able to actually attain the goals that you set out to do. The scope and limitations is actually one of my favorite parts of the introduction because it tells me, as the maker, and my readers, up to what extent am I willing to go through for me to complete my research. At this point, we try to include the demographics or the sample size of our study. We try to explain where and when we're going to do the experiment. 
and what specific parameters we're going to check in the study. So at this point, it's like a reminder to our readers to not expect anything beyond what we want to do. So if you look at the scope and limitations of the paper of my students, we used it as an opportunity to remind our readers that we are focusing on the mung bean plant. So they should not be looking for any other plant in the study. Apart from this, the scope and limitation was also used to remind our readers that we will only be performing the observations for 120 days, as well as the different growth and chemical parameters that we will be measuring. We also highlighted that we will not be collecting natural acid rain. Instead, we will be simulating it based on published protocol and we will be limiting it to a particular pH. Finally, we highlighted the fact that the protocols we are following are limited by the safety conditions of the university. And this is particularly true for our younger researchers because as much as possible, we want to keep you safe. It is very tempting to use the scope and limitations as a portion for you to dump all of your excuses about your study. But as much as possible, when you write this part, you have to take in a tone that is not whiny. So that this does not make you sound like a spoiled child. As much as possible also, avoid starting sentences with the researchers will not do this or the proponents cannot do that. This makes it sound like you're basically not doing anything. Instead, phrase your scope and limitations in such that you are trying to do something very important, but only to a certain extent. And finally, try to not use your lack of skills or limitations in time and budget as an excuse for not doing something. There are better ways of phrasing this, and at this point, it would be best to consult with your own advisors on how best to phrase these kinds of limitations. A good introduction ends with the significance of the study because it is good to remind your audience that your study is worth doing. One way to outline your significance of the study is to highlight the importance of your study to the discipline that you're involved with and the contribution of your study to the knowledge about a particular subject. You can also highlight the relevance of your study that will benefit a specific group of people or even the greater community. Finally, if your research has any commercial applications or patentable innovations, you have to highlight it at this portion also. When writing the significance of the study, a common mistake of students is to promise the world. Well, nobody expects you to heal the world. That's just a song. So please be realistic when outlining your significance. So here we show you the very humble significance of the study of our research on acid rain and mung beans. As you can see, our significance is very concrete because it helps farmers and botanists understand the effects of acid rain on a specific plant and when you can actually observe its detrimental effects. This will be very useful if you're growing mung beans at home so that you know when to protect your plants from the rain and also what kinds of detrimental effects to expect if you have limitations in opportunities to protect your plants from acid rain. So that concludes our short discussion on what to expect from an introduction. Remember that a good introduction has two general parts. The first part contains the background of the study, the research problem or opportunity that you want to tackle, and the specific research questions that you want answered. The hypothesis of the study should be in this first part also. Finally, for the second half, you get to outline your goals or research objectives, the scope and limitations of your study, and of course, the significance of your research. I hope this lecture has been helpful for you. And if you have any comments or advice, please let me, your resident Filipina scientists know in the comments section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. And at the same time, happy writing. See you around!